Thank you, Masibiri. Uh, next, we have another round of lightning talks. And even though there's short talks, it has the very long name of case studies showcasing examples of humanities and social sciences research projects with computational or digital elements. Uh, and our first speaker there will be Priscilla Corsa. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, thanks, DH Ignite uh, organizing team uh, for this opportunity. I know I only have 10 minutes, but I need to say this uh, because I wasn't sure what to say in 10 minutes because there's so much I would like to say, but now I've been given, you know, uh, a time cap to sort of figure out what you know I can offer you in, 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 in 10 minutes. So it was quite a struggle to put together uh, the slides for them to be as brief as, as, as possible. So I hope in the 10 minutes you will be able to get something useful and insightful uh, for, for, for you in your different fields of research. So I would like in the next 10 minutes to briefly talk to you through my reflections of using Atlas TI uh, from my PhD uh, research project and what I consider as strengths and, and, and limitations. On the guidelines of preparing the presentation, we're informed, you know, you need to tell the audience who, who you are and why they need to listen to you, which I find it very tricky. I'm using your words now, not color. You said we are different trees. You know, your white curry, your forest, or a mango tree. I'm from Limpopo, so we've got a lot of mangoes. You could be a mango tree. Uh, so I do believe that we are all trees, and it doesn't matter which kind of tree. We should still be able to learn uh, from each other, not because I'm a professor, you are a student, then you can't really, you know, learn from me. But in any case, since I've been given a mandate, I need to tell you a bit about who I am. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Social Work. I am a qualitative researcher uh, because of my academic career, that's what I've done. I am in no way a, a, a specialist or an expert when it comes to Atlas TI, but I have used this tool uh, for my PhD and I found it useful. And from there I've been able to facilitate few workshops and sharing my experiences of how I used uh, the tool. What I am though is an expert in my research, which is uh, social work supervision. So I used this tool to analyze uh, data that I collected for my PhD, which focused on social work uh, supervision. So I'm not gonna do the first part because that is like a whole hour uh, a talk, but what I will share with you is few lessons from the, the experience and also maybe give you some scuffed tin, you know, but cosignana food for thought for you to take with this this afternoon. How many of us in this room have used Atlas TI before? Okay, okay, I see. <laughs> How many of us are considering using Atlas TI? Okay, hopefully after this you may consider <laughs> using it. Uh, so what is this uh, Atlas TI? So it is a qualitative software uh, a program which allows you to categorize information, your data in this case, and you find it stored in that software uh, program. So instead of you, because as a qualitative researcher, I mean from my undergrad up to my master's, in terms of data analysis, I will sit with those transcripts. You know, I will sit with those audios and figure out what do I do with this data? You know, page through, do the highlights in order to make sense of what um, the information means and interpret it from there. But with Atlas TI, you're able to have all that in one space. You know, then that allows you to interrogate the data that you can see captured in one place instead of paging through 20, 30 pages of a transcript. Uh, so this is just an example of how you know, the tool or the page will look when you, uh, when you open Atlas TI. So this was still 
uh, Atlas TI9, but I think there's 22. Last year I used 22, I think there's 23 now, so I don't have the recent um, version of it. Uh, so you can see, I'm not sure what I'm pointing, but wherever it is, so those are the different tools. You can code, you can, uh, uh, you can import, you can extract information, so it gives you those tools. But what is important is that you need to fit it information. Earlier on, we spoke about chat GPT to say, you know, you ask it a question and it gives you all the answers. Atlas TI doesn't do that. You sort of need to guide it based on what you have fed it, whether it's audio, whether it's transcripts, whether it's visual material, whether it's documents, you need to feed it into it and then ask it, you know, what you want. Uh, um, the tool to be. So as much as this is a software program that allows you to analyze your data and make sense of it, because as a qualitative researcher, you still need to use the process. There still has to be a method of how you are analyzing uh, the data. So though I was using the tool, I still followed a particular method in analyzing that data. So as you can see, I used Brown and Schlag stages of data analysis. So I still needed to familiarize myself with the data that I ca captured or uploaded onto the onto the software, I still needed to make sense of it, I still needed to generate uh, themes, and I'm sure maybe if you put on chat GPK, say, come up with these themes, perhaps it can. So that doesn't do that. You need to develop those themes uh, for, your, for yourself, and then go back again and review. So you can review, reuse, revise um, those, those, or those themes that you have developed. And of course, you do the naming. You know, you do the naming here because this is your, your data and thereafter produce a, a report, which could be in a form of an article. In my case, obviously, it was in a form of a PhD dissertation. So these are some of the strengths that I considered, you know, using the, using the two. Firstly, definitely useful. I conducted uh, 28 interviews with social workers of an average of an hour. You can imagine, you know, the data that I had. Um, and, and I thought there's no way I'm going to sift through 28 transcripts at once and begin to make sense of, of, of it. Um, so it enabled me to manage the data using that tool and, and again try to make sense of the meaning of the data that I, 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 I collected. And of course, because it's the tool, you, you can store your information is there. Uh, you know, you can save, you can undo uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the program. If you code and you're like, no, no, actually, I don't like how I've coded this, you can always redo and, and come up with another, with another uh, code for your, for your data. And what I found useful as well was because I always struggled with my right brain part of it to so say how do we become creative in presenting uh, your data because in qualitative research we want to hear the voices, you know, the voices of participants. That's why we do qualitative research and that's why we conduct interviews because we want to hear what, you know, the people we are interviewing or the stakeholders we are engaging with, what are they saying, you know, and then how do we present that data? It's a matter of quotation, bringing in those voices in your data presentation. So, but I thought this tool enables me to also present my data creatively. I don't have to every page or in my uh, write-up chapter then include only their voices. I could also use images. You know, I could use graphs which represents um, the, the, the analysis uh, of, of the data collected. And, and of course, you are able to also compare you know, the data that you have developed networks. I think uh, it was Jonathan yesterday was using computation and network uh, uh, analysis system, something like that. So with this software as well, there is a tool that you can also create different networks. But with those networks, it's network based on the data that you have fed into the onto the program. And what I found most valuable, because with, with any uh, uh, research, with any research, and particularly qualitative research, we always grapple around the authenticity, the credibility, you know, the rigorness on the credibility of our own of our own research or the trustworthiness of our own research because the reviewers or even your examiners, they need to determine is this information trustworthy, 
you know, can we really verify the data and have you used the methods necessary for you to collect this data? So through using this tool, I was able then to explain clearly and even provide evidence in my write-up to say, this is what I mean, I've shown you a picture now. Um, Earlier on, so I could then retrieve that information and extract it from Atlas TI and say, listen, these were the transcripts that have been uploaded. These are the different themes that I had in the in the beginning. And this is how when I modified after, you know, going through the transcripts again, I thought, no, the themes are not working. And then I developed these different uh, categories. And then from those different categories, these are the quotations as my evidence would support um, we support those different uh, themes that I have identified. So I could tell the reader that and provide the relevant uh, evidence for, for, for it. And, and because most of the data either is audio or it's, it's video or it's, it's document, sometimes it's unstructured, it can be you know, uh, all over the place. But if it is stored into uh, Atlas TI, you can then focus on, on the material, you can then focus on the analysis, you can see all, pull together all the different sets of, of your collected data and begin to make sense. If you've uploaded documents, if you're doing secondary analysis, you can tap into that. If it's interviews, if it's audios, you can also look into that and actually do your comparison in a very systematic um, systematic way. And again, lovely tool wherein you can use the codes multiple times. For instance, if you read the first, uh, let me give you an example, in your first uh, uh, interview transcript, you know, it's an interview with a social worker, it's an hour, because obviously your interview schedule, you'll be asking more or less the similar questions to the, uh, to the participants. So if in that particular first interview, I identify, okay, my code in this is perhaps a administrator of supervision, which is one form of supervision. And then in the next uh, interview, again, you identify patterns that speaks to administrative supervision. You add that. So you don't have to redo it uh, again. You can you know, immediately use that, uh, that, that, that code. And when you, you re reuse that code, you can already begin to see the patterns um, from, from that data. And then in terms of the limitations, I mean, I suppose with every software program or tool, there are, there are limitations. And what I found as, as, as limitations, it doesn't do the work for you. <laughs> you know, you don't just put it there and say, hey, analyze my, uh, my, they analyze my interview, make sense. No, you still need to interpret what, uh, you know, what, what, what it said, you direct it in terms of extractive, it's networks, you, you need to tell it to say, okay, I want to develop a network based on those different, um, different, different voices. And, and it's a pity I didn't share that with you, but I will share a link later on where you can see the demonstrations of how it will actually, you know, uh, uh, work if you were to use the software. Uh, so, though coding might be quick in such a way that if you are using, obviously, your paper transcripts or you have it in Word, in Excel, whatever format that you are using, uh, you know, manually to analyze your, your, uh, your data, the different thing here is that it will not be possible for you to actually code and analyze if it's not embedded in theory. You know, so you sort of need to bring in the theoretical framework, the theoretical lens. This is where your interpretation uh, need to come in. And I think the previous speaker as well did mention some of the limitation of chat GBTI to say where is the intuition, where is the, uh, the interpretation, where is the originality. So even with uh, using this tool, you still need to bring that um, theoretical elements in. And of course, avoid the confusion because it has an SPSS element, a statistical version to is so, and it can give you different word counts, frequent count, but the, it's, it's a matter of how do you use that information for your, uh, uh, in terms of your research. And the part cause the takeaway, I hope in summary, uh, to say I found it user friendly, and I hope you will, should you intend to use it. Accessible, accessible is debatable. I think the way that I would rather use, and I've learned it from the one speaker yesterday, it's findable because accessibility, I'm not sure if in all universities, you know, you will have this tool for free. 
but maybe findable, you know where to find uh, the tool. It does save time. I think if I had not used it, I would still be analyzing the data right now. I wouldn't have, you know, graduated. And, and of course, creatively, you are able to store that data in one in one place. For more information, I have facilitated a webinar for the African Doctoral Academy explaining exactly how, you know, the process, you know, step by step. So you're welcome to go check that out. Thank you all. I think we're a bit short on time for questions. Okay, we're taking questions. Uh, please don't go to Pris uh, Priscilla. Um, are there any questions? I see over there. You, you can have the mic if you want to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, so I realized I have a real sister here. So um, thank you, because I'm also into Atlas TI. I just wanted to add, and um, this is version nine, but the version 22, version 23. Um, even is friendlier. You said it's user friendly, but I would say user friendlier and gives um, you the opportunity now to do social media analysis. The older version would use Twitter, but now you can do Facebook, YouTube, and all those analysis. And um, the thing about quantitative data is also gotten better now because now you can. Um, add your survey data in a way that you can really analyze it easily when you are doing mixed method, especially. Um, so just wanted to add those comments and say, yeah, you have a sister here, and thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. All right, then our next presenter has uh, submitted a video, and that is Sisanda Nguala, uh, so please enjoy. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sisan Langwala. I'm a senior lecturer in the media department at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share with you as part of these lightning talks. Thank you very much for having afforded me the opportunity. The project that I am presenting on is um, my ongoing work on digitizing the early South African black press the development of a digital archive of multilingual journalistic texts for teaching, learning, and research within higher education. I'm really grateful to the different organizations that have supported this work. My project is basically um, aimed at digitizing texts from the early South African black press. And here is a screen grab of um, one of the digital um, platforms that I have used, namely a Google site where I have taken these old newspapers, um, many of which were in the 1800s up to the early 1900s, and I've had them scanned and as a preliminary step have uploaded them based on the type or the name of the publication and the years. It is an ongoing work, um, which will hopefully eventually digitize as many of these publications as is possible. So as I've said, the aim is to digitize these texts and then to develop um, and add to the existing journalism curriculum. Um, perspectives that are decolonial, transdisciplinary, and insta-institutional by virtue of what these texts represent. My hope is that this digital archive will be open access, interactive, and that those who use it will have access to the metadata. Currently, what is interesting, and I think this speaks to some of the uh, dynamics 
of digitizing within the humanities. These texts are housed in three different places because uh, one of the challenges I think for digitizing in the humanities is finding platforms that are fit for purpose for what we would want a, a digital humanities project, a specific digital humanities project to do. So mine are currently available in these three sites. The first being this Google site where all of the texts um, that I have managed so far to get scanned have been uploaded. Then there is a second platform, which is as part of the revolutionary papers uh, teaching tool, where in, on that platform, I am able to um, employ some interactive techniques where people can zoom in on a particular person. They can look at um, information that pertains to a particular development. Um, something that they cannot do on the Google site because that site is specifically just for having the content there. And then still, there's a third platform that I've made use of, and this is the AfriDig or Mecca site, wherein I have been able to load some metadata pertaining to these texts. So the revolutionary teach the revolutionary papers teaching tool does not allow one to add metadata. And because I need um, whoever interacts with the texts to understand where they come from, who the editor was, um, to see if there are linkages between certain articles across different newspapers, metadata is important in this project. So finding, as you can see, one platform that would really be a suitable digital tool has proven to be a challenge. And I think this is where the need for humanity scholars to work closely with IT people, digital people, to develop tools that will enable us to do the kind of work that we need to do becomes important. So they can develop the platforms, but if they don't understand what we as humanity scholars will use them for, those platforms might not be fit for purpose. On the other end, we may have these ideas in terms of the kind of data we want our platforms to um, be able to show um, and not be able, though, to actually um, articulate and develop a platform to do so. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you each of these sites and uh, give you an idea of some of their strengths and limitations so that you can view the project holistically. So starting with the Google site, really the first um, artifact that I developed when I got um, a very small amount of seed funding, what I've done <clears throat> is I have um, just created a platform where I give a bit of background on what the early Black South African, what the early South African Black press is. Here at the top, you see the names of the different publications that I've managed to work with. Umteteli, Wabandu, Abandu Bato, Izwi Labandu, Izwi, Lakiti, etc. And you can obviously see more here. This at this stage is by no means a comprehensive um, archive. It is based primarily on what I have money to be able to work on at any given time. So if we look at the Umteteli Wabandu page, the title will be there. The years in which the publication was in circulation will be there. I give an overview of um, what that publication was about. And then I have uploaded the different issues. So for the one that was published on the 8th of May, 1920, the 15th of May, 1920. And um, so far, I've only been able to do four. And a person can then click on the pop out tool. And once they click on the pop out tool, they can then get to see the newspaper as a whole. The strength of this, I hope you can see, is that it is very easy to navigate. It's a straightforward um, overview of some of the texts of the early Black South African press that I'm working with. The limitation is currently they are only available in the scanned form, so it's very difficult to search. Um, it's really, you can't really do too much with something like this, except maybe read it. And even there, you have to actually read it online which in this day and age is not particularly user-friendly when you may want to be able to download something and, and highlight, et cetera. So that is the first, um, that is the first uh, uh, platform that I have used. If I look at the second platform, the Revolutionary Papers Teaching Tool, now this 
particular platform does not belong to me. It is part of um, a platform created by an entity called the Revolutionary Papers. And let me take you to the Revolutionary Papers full site so that you can have sight of it. Here you see that the, the platform um, provides space to different publications um, that you know are from around the world. So one can click on a publication and then see some information around that publication. This is an inter-institutional, um, interdisciplinary uh, platform. So you see this one, for example, is by Dilip Menon, and it gives you a little bit of an overview as to what this publication does. Within the Revolutionary Papers um, site, there is a section on teaching tools. Now, these tools were people who wanted to be on the platform, but wanted to use their archives or materials to engage in teaching. So they are set up in such a way that unlike when you click on this one, where you just see some information about the publication and you see a page, you can actually interact with the, with the document. So let me click on the teaching tool. And what you see here is a range of the teaching tools that colleagues have um, produced. And let me go to mine where I've got it here. And I click on it and you see here, it gives you the, the title and then it tells you a little bit about the, the producer. And you get some information about the publications, which is information that I have obviously researched and you move down and you can see here, there are certain blocks that are, have borders around them, certain words that are highlighted. If you click on these, it pops up and tells you a little bit about the Queen Regent Lo, uh, Labo Tsibeni, um, and you can read up about her. And if you scroll down, you can see where the information about her comes from. It also tells you, if you click on this one, about the South African Native National Congress and gives you a picture and tells you about these, uh, this Congress, and you can get a reference for where the information comes from. So this document or this platform allows a person not just to interact with the archive, but to get background information about the content of the archive. The nature of this also allows one to cut and paste. So you can copy and paste um, if you wanted to quote large sections of um, the, 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 the page, um, something that you can't do on the Google site. Then, moreover, we could uh, scan a page. And as you see here, some sections of the page are highlighted in green, like this seven, seven mixture thing. There are some words that are highlighted here. And if you click on the green portions that are highlighted, it does what it does with um, what it did with the, the, the previous plot place that I showed you, but this time clicking directly on the publication. So you see here, you get background information that you can find out more on. Here, you can actually find out more information on the content. And here, there were, this is a tagline from Abantu Bato, um, and um, I tell you a little bit more about it. If I click here, this discusses the 7-7 seven, seven mixture, which was basically an advertorial. And not only does it tell you about it, but I engage in some critical um, work on um, the stuff that we see on the front of the publication. If I click here on the date, for example, you get this, um, this, uh, this comment that tells you that this particular issue was published close to the end of the newspaper's lifespan. Um, if we scroll down to the second one, you see something similar. Click here, again, front page as advertorial as with the previous one, but here it tells you a bit more about this particular advertorial. It tells you about the tagline of this particular uh, publication, something that you would not be able to do on the Google site. So that is the second platform that I have worked on for this project. Uh, it is exciting for me to do this kind of work because it is completely out of my comfort zone. 
it is a very uh, collaborative. So I have worked, as you can see, with revolutionary papers. Those tend to be history colleagues. Um, the Afri dig tend to be digital colleagues, some in history, some in sociology, etc. The Google site is, is sort of my own baby. And that interdisciplinary perspective, I think, is one of the strengths of digital humanities, that it forces us to move outside of our humanity silos to collaborate together because the texts that we work with are interdisciplinary for the most part. I think what is also exciting is um, working with colleagues within the digitization aspect who then expose you to new technologies. And where we are today is really quite an improvement from when I started with this project in 2019 where I am now working with colleagues that are uh, from the University of Cape Town Sociology Department who do work on taking the texts, such as the ones in my Google site, and making them readable so that people can actually search. And that is um, quite a, a huge endeavor. But once these texts are created like that, they will serve the humanities broadly. Um, I think it is very encouraging and very inspiring to be involved in digital humanities, particularly because so much is unknown. And as we do the work, we discover how to do it. Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you. In her absence, I believe, to Sisanda. I know she was on a line previously, but it seems like she's not right now, so we, uh, she'll not be able to take any questions. Um, so next will be Robin Berghoff. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is... Robin Berghoff, um, as said, the title of my talk today is Using Eye Tracking to Examine Language Processing in Real Time. So I'm at the Department of General Linguistics at Stellenbosch University, where together with my colleague, Professor Emmanuel Bilund, I'm responsible for the Multilingualism and Cognition Laboratory, which to our knowledge is the only research laboratory of its sort on the African continent. The Multicog Lag is a research lab for psycholinguistics, which is the discipline that investigates the processes um, involved in mastering and using language. And these are mental processes, right, which means that they're not directly observable. So because of that, we have a variety of methods that allow us to get insight into these processes in a more indirect manner. And one of these methods, the one that I'll talk to you about today, is eye tracking. And the eye tracker that we have in our lab looks uh, a lot like this one. In fact, it is that one, except we don't study chess. Uh, and the machine itself is that that is circled in red there. So eye tracking, you know, as applied to language use cases, allows us to precisely measure the movements of people's eyes as they either read a text on a screen or as they listen to auditory input and then at the same time process some kind of visual input on the screen. So as far as these kinds of methods go, eye tracking is fairly non-intrusive, right? The participant behaves quite naturally. They're doing a task while indirectly we monitor their behavior. So it's a fairly good method of getting insight into language processing, language comprehension in real time. The output of an eye tracking experiment might look something like this, right? If you were looking at the processing of some kind of visual image, where the circles on the screen represent where our participants' eyes landed, and the size of a circle is um, a representation of how long their eyes were at that particular point. So a big circle means that my eyes rested at that point for a long time. And the lines there represent movement of the eyes between what we call fixation points. And when we interpret this kind of data, we make a number of assumptions, right? Because this is an indirect measure of a psychological process. So A, we assume that what the eyes are looking at represents what the participant is processing at that time. And a corollary of that is a larger circle, in a sense here, so a longer time spent fixating on a particular point in an image or in a text represents more effort spent processing that part of the image or that part of the text. Okay. So, a lot of my work is about bi and multilingual language processing, and a question of interest in this area 
is for bilingual, multilingual people, how do we store our two or more languages? And how do we activate these languages as we navigate through the world? So we can imagine at least two possibilities, right? One is that our two languages are completely separate and we turn one on when the context demands that one while the other one is switched off, right? So that would mean as you guys listen to me, your English is switched on, any other language you know is switched off. That is a, a possibility. Another possibility is that the languages are intertwined, right? Your two or more languages are interrelated in a sense, and they're always active to a greater or a lesser extent. And in that case, regardless of the context that you find yourself in, regardless of the fact that I am only speaking English now, your other language knowledge is also active in the background. So we uh, did an experiment in the lab to investigate this question, specifically with respect to what we call lexical access, so word recognition. And we asked, uh, you know, in a monolingual context, like this is for this very limited 10-minute period, do bilinguals only activate the language that is being used, or is there other language knowledge also active? So to explore this, we recruited two groups of participants. One group was... English, right, first language English, and the other group was first language Afrikaans with English as a second language. But importantly, when we recruited the second group there, the bilingual group, we really downplayed the relevance of bilingualism to the experiment. So it wasn't made clear to participants that a requirement for them to participate was that they be bilingual. That was very much in the background. So we had our participants then come into the lab where the environment was completely English, and we did an experiment that was administered entirely in English, meaning that Afrikaans was never used, uh, mentioned throughout the session, right? And the task that we did was really quite simple. We had participants sit in front of a computer, do the task on a computer. Uh, they were looking at images like this, a display screen with four separate images on it, and while they did the task, they would receive an auditory instruction saying, click on the target now, as I'll explain to you now in a bit more detail. So the crucial components of this display screen here are what we call target competitor pairs, right? Uh, where the target noun, its name in English, would overlap phonetically, overlap in sound, with the name of the competitor noun in Afrikaans. So in this case, the target noun was a lion, right? That's called a lion. And our competitor noun was this one over here. That in English is called a drawer, right? But in Afrikaans, it's called a lie. It sounds the same as lion, right? They've got the same phonetic onset. In uh, such a display screen, we also have two other images, right? Those are our unrelated distractor items. In the top right, you've got a hose. In Afrikaans, it's called a tain slung. The bottom left, you've got a glass. In Afrikaans, it's called a glas. These, you'll note, have got nothing to do sound-wise with lion or lie. They are sound-wise unrelated. So participants would see a screen like this with these four images, and they'd hear an instruction like, click on the lion. And then we start measuring their eye movements at the onset of that critical target word, lion. And the point of interest in our analysis is whether they look at that competitor item, the drawer, more than they look at the two unrelated items. And remember, we're doing this entirely in English, so there's no reason for them to look at the lie any more than they look at the glas or the tainslung. When we did the analysis we saw for the Afrikaans participants, but not for the English participants, they look statistically significantly more at the competitor noun than at the two unrelated distractor nouns, right? So uh, graphically, it looks a little bit like this. If we zoom in, the two bottom lines are representations of the gazes of the English participants. We're comparing now looks at, for example, the lie versus looks to the glass and the tainslung, the glass and the hose. For the English participants, they look at all three of those images roughly equally, right? There's no favoring of the competitor item over the distractors, but if you look at the top two lines that are separated in space, right? we see that the Afrikaans participants look more at that competitor item than they do at the unrelated distractor items, suggesting that their Afrikaans knowledge is activated even in this entirely monolingual context. Okay, so that is an example of a sort of research question that we can answer using digital methods, 
related to uh, language processing. If you're interested in this kind of thing, please do let me know. You can drop me an email or come speak to me. Or please also check out the website of the African Psycholinguistics Association, which is an association that aims to promote this kind of research on the African continent. Thanks. Right. Um, that was a very interesting presentation. If, I, if anyone has any questions, you can just raise your hand. I'm not seeing any at present. Thank you. Um, just a very quick one in terms of visual impairment. Obviously, there's been some selection process, but in terms of language learning and something like visual Im impairment, just any comments? Well, um, so I, I mean, I guess one can approach this from a, a variety of angles. I mean, a, a question is, is whether eye tracking is a suitable method to use with visually impaired people and I suppose that depends to a large extent on the nature of the impairment. I mean, if it's, um, you know, total occlusion, then obviously not. But I guess you can use the same method with people who are, um, you know, impaired to a lesser extent would be possible. In terms of language learning, uh, this is a widely used method as well. Um, I mean... Typically, if you are doing these, these kinds of things, and I do a lot of this kind of thing, you'll be comparing a native speaker group with a second language group, right? People who are still learning the language. And there are ways in which people's gaze behavior differs according to that factor, right? Nativeness or second languageness, learningness. Um, so it can give you quite a lot of insight into the way in which people are learning the language, what they have mastered, what they're still struggling with, etc. Yeah, I don't know if that, that answers it. Yeah, I think there's, there is probably some stuff along those lines happening. I'm not so big in the developmental literature, child language stuff. Unfortunately, my colleague has left. She could have addressed that one for you, but I'm, I'm quite sure there is work of that nature being done. Yeah. Do I have another question? No. Are we done? All right, and then... Uh, I don't know if we have time for one more question. Yes, I was just wondering how you would relate this to what used to be called language transfer. Okay. So, well, this is language transfer in a sense, right? It's cross-language activation. So, I mean, we transfer, as you probably know, is, is a term that usually used to imply carrying over from the first language into the second language, uh, which in this case happens, right, because we've got people activating first language knowledge in a second language context. But it goes both ways. So we have other data from a similar experiment showing activation of the second language in a first language context. So, yeah, basically, I mean, this kind of result has been replicated in many different paradigms, and all languages are active all the time, really. Um, yeah, so it relates to transfer in that sense very strongly, I think. Yeah. So. yeah, sorry, just a comment um, or a question from Delight um, from the online saying great presentation. My question is how the language learning can be efficient after successive training or methods to distinguish between dialects in local languages. Hmm, um, okay, so training to distinguish between dialects and, and language learning. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to, to link these things. Um, and, and also, training in what sense? Because mm. dialects can be, I mean, usually they differ most markedly in terms of lexical items, right? Mm. I use this word for this, but you use another word. 
And depending on how closely the things are related, you know, the differences might not be very relevant. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, that, that was not a useful answer of any sort, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how to respond. Okay. 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 Um, it seems it seems I'm audible. Um, so, uh, despite ESCOM, the show must carry on. Uh, the next presenter is Hilton Wistazen, and uh, please welcome him to the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Knox, please don't, st don't start the clock yet. I just <laughs> need to take a selfie. I'm going to send this <laughs> to my mother and father so that they can see. I oh, shame they will be so proud that their son is actually doing something productive. And can I have a thumbs, thumbs up from you? so that they can see there are still people left here. <laughs> oh, that is so nice. Shame. They're going to be so proud of me. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hilton Westhuizen, um, affiliated uh, to the University of the Western Cape at the Department of Industrial Psychology. As a scholar, I am um, affiliated as a PhD scholar at the Erasmus University Rotterdam, uh, specifically at the uh, Erasmus School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Now, I'm particularly interested in uh, the measurement of counterproductive work behavior. Now, I also want some answer answers from you. Just by a show of hands, who engage in counterproductive work behavior? Okay, who, do a, who d frequently engages in it, like in once a month? Okay, okay, so once in six months, maybe? Once a year, okay. Once a year. Now we're talking about things like um, production deviance, uh, sabotage, theft or misuse of resources. Um, do you do that? Do you make some photocopies for your child at 
the workplace? <laughs> Do you engage in social media for long periods of time at work? But it even gets more complicated because we're working in a hybrid work environment now. Now, the possibilities are so much greater. Now, how do we measure this? Now, this is where it becomes complicated. Because, yes, as psychologists and industrial psychologists, we love measuring things. And it has to be scientifically valid and reliable. But there are some nuisance factors that comes into play when we engage in the measurement of such behavior. And that is exactly the problem that I'm investiga investi investigating. Faking in counterproductive work behavior measurement. So, um, yeah, this research study is entitled An Enlightened Truth of Self-Report Counterproductive Work Behavior a Bayesian truth serum approach. Now, counterproductive work behavior is a very important um, concept in the overall um, 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 measurement of work performance. It has an important weight in the um, total space of uh, job performance, an important weight of 19%. Now, employers, um, for whichever reason, uh, fail to measure this and take this into account. But when we measure it, it is a very sensitive topic to measure. So are you going to be truthful about it? So in the measurement of counterproductive work behavior, what we have available to us is self-reported self-report questionnaires. Now, it doesn't matter how anonymous it is. Are you going to admit to it? Now, how do we determine the truth? How can we actually um, objectively determine whether you are faking? So, um, yes, the usefulness of uh, Self-report non-cognitive assessments is highly dependent on the respondents' truthful responses in order to make meaningful inferences from the self-report data. Now, intentional response distortion is especially prevalent in assessment of high-stakes environment, for example, um, employee selection, because you want to put a good foot forward. You want to present yourself in the best way possible. And also, if you are a job incumbent, when you are asked un uncomfortable questions and uncomfortable things are measured, you still want to put your best foot forward. Okay, so we fake. So now we have to deal with a, a construct of social desirability. Now, social desirability is um, subdivided into two constructs. Um, first, self-deceptive enhancement. Now, in Afrikaans, say ons, um, hy praat so baie, double K, middle A, dat hy homself gloe. In English, it translates to, you talk so much nonsense that you believe yourself. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about presenting yourself in a very favorable way. Now, that is impression management, and that is directly um, related to faking and faking behavior. So, methods of faking detection um, goes back quite in history. Historical roots is in, um, found in the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, um, in which they had various uh, validity scales to determine the um, in response distortion um, on various levels. Um, furthermore, from that, um, uh, developed uh, social desire, various social desirability scales. But the problem with that is that researchers has found that it is actually related to um, stable personality traits. So you measure more substance than um, style, response style. Okay, so we uh, moved further on. 
Um, incorporation of unlikely virtue scales. Now that measures typical scale items, um, including questions about eternal kindness towards all living beings, always refraining from using foul language and never engaging in any form of dishonesty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we know that is very much unlikely to happen. Okay, but what was found is that this um, type of measurement um, and score adjustment um, cannot be used as an adequate me me measure of a score adjustment. Okay, furthermore, there was an overclaiming index, um, also not um, a good score adjustment system, but then we get to item response theory. Now, what research has found is that the process of faking is fundamentally an item level phenomenon. So we want to go and look at the various items. Okay, so it's been used in various experimental contexts. Um, so essentially we want to see what is happening on an item level. So what I propose, and it has not been used, is to detect the truth, to establish the truth um, by using the Bayesian truth serum. Now, those who are not acquainted to the Bayesian theorem of possibility, um, so the Bayesian theory of probability is an interpretation of the concept of probability in which instead of frequency of uh, or propensity of some phenomenon, which is known, for example, um, one can determine what is my chances of winning the lotto, and that is 1 over 6 to the power of 49. That is a known probability. Okay? But when you have an unknown probability, we make use of the Bayesian truth, uh, the, the Bayesian uh, probability theory, which is interpreted as a, a reasonable expectation uh, representing a state of knowledge or as a quant um, quantification of personal belief. So the Bayesian interpretation of probability can be seen as an extension of uh, proposi uh, propositional lo logic that enables reasoning with uh, hypotheses, that is, um, with propositions whose truth or falsity is unknown. So, the more data we get, the more we discover the truth. Okay, so, by making use of the Bayesian truth theorem, we discover the truth. Now, where the, does the truth lie? The tr truth lies within yourself. So, by making use of a, a quite intuitively scoring method, um, uh, this adjusts self-report scores by maximizing honest answers based on the sample distribution of the prediction of the population frequency. Okay, so I'm going to skip through um, a couple of details. I have to wrap up now. So, it requires two pieces, pieces of information. Firstly, the individual's response to the self-report item, as well as the individual's prediction of the sample distribution for each response. So, um, it will then total up to 100%. Now, by doing some computations um, and getting a, a logarithmic um, 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 ratio of the um, relative fre frequency of the answer um, over the geometric mean of the answer's predicted frequency, we get an information score, which is an indicator of the truth. And furthermore, um, the individual's prediction um, uh, accuracy score is then also calculated in which we can then objectively see to what degree are you telling the truth. And um, yes, I don't want to jump the gun, uh, but this will be published um, in the winter of this year. 
So please um, watch this space. And I see it's time to, for me to leave. Um, but yes, thank you for your attention um, at this late afternoon sp spot. Seems like we might have time for one question. And our next presenter is Nomkulisi Yankees. Welcome, Nomkulisi. Good afternoon. So I'm presenting on the development of online multilingual glossaries at CPUT. Now, we are all aware that um, the institutions, all the higher education institutions have been tasked with um, developing, um, uh, sorry, uh, developing um, indigenous languages and intellectualizing these languages for educational use. And at CPUT, we started with the multilingual glossaries. At CBUT, we started with the uh, multilingual glossaries, and then we decided that instead of just um, using these uh, manually, let's move them um, online. So this is a collaborative pro uh, project between our unit, which is the language unit, and CIET Center for Innov Innovative Educational Technology. I always get it wrong. Um, one, and actually, one of our leads in the project, who is based at CIET, um, recently finished her master's on this project. So we are just crossing our fingers for her. And so the, the multilingual glossaries um, were mainly for developing the languages and preserving these languages. But also, there was also a need um, to produce an additional resource um, for students who were not really doing well in their subjects. But then again, we're, also, we're still trying to move away from that language where we say students are, students are lacking, but we're just referring to this now, to this project now as a, as a project that is just um, adding, um, and it, that is producing an additional uh, resource. And it involves a lot of players. So I'll just take you through the process. So we work together with the lecturers when developing these and we work with them and their students. We ask the lecturers to work with the students to identify certain terms that they think are, are complex. Um, we try to limit our lists uh, to 100, but sometimes we get more than those. So if we have funds um, and time, then we would normally work on more than 100 terms, but we prefer the 100, 100 terms. And we translate, so the original language um, is English because the content is normally English in all the textbooks. And we translate this into Isikosa and Afrikaans. Now with, uh, so our unit is normally responsible for that. So with the translation of um, Isikosa and Afrikaans, our unit normally would prepare the documents to send out to um, our external service providers. So we work a lot with external service providers 
because in our unit we just have two um, language specialists. So the external service providers would um, uh, translate the context and then um, the content and then it comes back to us and then we just prepare it for our verification workshops. Now in the verification workshops, um, we go back to the lecturers again and say, uh, we have uh, the, the content and can you arrange your students so that we just sit in one room and work together on the content together. We are trying to get the students involved in saying, yes, um, this is to help you, but then at the same time, there is, there is something that you can bring to the table. So we don't want to use an inaccessible language because we know with a lot of translations, students always um, complain that uh, the language in, is inaccessible. So we try as much as we can to use a language that they would understand. So in, in us trying to uh, develop these glossaries. They are part of that and they would advise, okay, um, it would make sense if we were to say this and then um, that's what we use. And we also approach um, external uh, language specialists to come and advise on the correct use of language because we also don't want to um, let go of the authenticity of the language, that it, it, it becomes a resource that can't really be used. And after this whole process is concluded, then we upload the glossaries um, to our web website, the MLG website, This is which is that little thing that you see at the corner there. So that is our um, a landing page. Now this is just to show you what the verification workshops would look like. So this is everyone, students, us and uh, external people. And sometimes we do get, um, sometimes we do get um, um, experts in the field um, and so that they can come and say, okay, this is the language that we are currently using in the field. And um, at other times, we, we don't get them. And so you see in our setup, we try to make it in, informal for, so that it is um, comfortable for, for the students. And this is basically what we use. We're using like, uh, we would use like a, a normal word document and then we would work on this um, document, all of us contributing um, what we think should be used and, and all of that. So we would have three sessions. The first session would focus on the English. In the past, we never used to look at the English because we, we would take it as uh, this is the original content. But then the students again would say, well, the English itself is inaccessible. So we work with that, we work with the English and move to the different languages. And we have um, two sessions for Africans and Disclosure, which will run concurrently. And um, we, we fix the language that would make sense to the students. So this is just our landing page of the mlg.cput.ac.za um, uh, website. So you can just go in there and see what we have. Uh, we would like to have all the subjects at CPUT on the site, but um, this is still uh, an ongoing pro project. So we are now working with lecturers who are willing to come and, and work with us. So we work with all the faculties. Some of the faculties have more glossaries and others um, do not have that much. So just to show you an example, this is what we've done for the architectural subject. And um, this is basically a demonstration of the website and how you would normally use it. It's quite easy, it's up to you. You can use, uh, you can go to the letter and see um, what is under there or just use the search um, box. And then with the glossaries, we have a, an option to listen if you want to listen to Afrikaans or Isakosa. And then in some of the glossaries, I think it's only actually uh, architecture where we have illustrations. So we know that different um, students learn differently. Others would prefer to listen while others would prefer to just look at the images. So we're trying to accommodate um, everyone. 
And this is just the, um, the back end. So our colleague at, at, at CIET would monitor um, the back end and just to see how people would normally use the website, how often they go in there and where the people are, are based. And that is it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really interesting to hear. Um, I'd like to know for how, how long has this project been running? Okay, so, um, gosh, for quite a number of years. Um, okay, I got to CB 2015, but they started earlier, uh, but it was not online um, okay. when they started. It was just the lists, and people would, um, the lecturers would decide to print those out. But then I think from 2015, we got funding. Um, to create all of these, and then now we move the project online. But it, 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 it has been running for quite some time. And do you know how many terms you have on the, on the database? I wouldn't know, but no. it's a lot. Okay, no, I'm you still can, question You then. can go, it, it's actually accessible to everyone, because in, in, okay, initially we thought we were just gonna make it available to CPUT. So that's why if you go to the site, you would see that it has a registration. But now we're like, okay, let's, for now, let's open it for everyone so you can use it um, anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nompulisi. Uh, I'm sure we'll, your students especially appreciate the work you're doing. Um, our final presenter for the lightning rounds is Andre Daniels, and he will be joining us virtually, so fingers crossed for ISCOM. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, trust that everybody can hear me. Thank you very much for all the diehards that stays this late in the afternoon. So I know I'm... Um, what stands between you and wherever these that you have to go next. I promise my talk won't be very long. Um, firstly, thank you to um, the DH Ignite just for inviting me, uh, just to share a little bit about what I do. But before I jump into that, I also just want to acknowledge the, you know, the cameraman. Uh, that's the, I don't know how many people have actually noticed him there. Uh, thank you for the good work that you've done so far. And the reason I'm saying this is because that's that's where I started out. Um, and a large part of my work is still around video production. Uh, so anyway, my name is Andre Daniels. I'm also from the University of the Western Cape. And uh, I work for what is commonly known as e-learning. We call it the Center for Innovative Education and Communication Technologies. And that's a, it's a mouthful. And I'm the coordinator of digital media. Uh, and I've been there since 2005 when we first started with e-learning. So I've only got four slides. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is that I'm doing. So um, apart from the video production, I'm also involved with staff training and student training on different sort of e-tools, uh, concept mapping. Um, and I also teach on a uh, extended curriculum program uh, course that we're currently offering for first year students, uh, which focuses on digital media literacy. And then apart from that, I'm also involved with um, towards professionalization of teaching and, and learning courses that's, that's being offered. Um, I've recently started, well, recently as in this year, started my PhD. So I'm fairly new at that. But one of the areas of specialization is uh, digital storytelling. Um, and I'm sure many of you may have heard of digital storytelling. You, you might be involved with it yourself. I've been involved with digital storytelling since 2005. And um, I've seen it change in many ways. Um, I've seen it being adopted by especially higher education. And, and it's more often being used these days um, to develop uh, digital literacy skills, and in particular, digital media literacy skills. Um, now, I remember when we started with e-learning, and I don't know at the various institutions, you know, what um, your particular starting point was, but we were always told that don't let the technology drive the learning. Um, and so I, th I think the unintended consequence of that was that we actually haven't paid a lot of attention 
to the influence that technology and especially with uh, in the context of digital storytelling you know what kind of how does it actually shape us because we know that technology is not neutral um, and what if effect and impact does it have on us so that hence the title of my uh, you know presentation today technological non-neutrality uh, looking at the digital storytelling perspective um can go on to the next slide please so for those of you who might not know what digital storytelling is about, and I've put it in, in, in trying to put it in, in very simple terms, it's an approach that combines the art of traditional storytelling with affordances of modern day digital technologies. Now, um, my background is science. And when I was first introduced to technologies, it was, um, well, computers rather, it was, it was more through playing. Um, so I'm, I'm what is known as a digital migrant, if you're familiar with that term. I wasn't born in the area or with, with technologies. And so when I first used technologies, I thought, okay, so now I know the technical stuff. I know how to use the technology, but now what? What do I do with it? And that's when I was introduced to digital storytelling. And it's, it's strange that at that point, I suddenly found meaning around what it is that I was doing. And strangely, at that time too, I worked a lot with social work and um, with humanities, with uh, psychology students, um, and these days are actually it's actually expanding. So just to move on from that, if you if you see there at the bottom, says it's also characterized as a short first person narrative of between two and six minutes that bring together multimedia elements um, like narration or animation, images, audio and video. So it is not necessarily um, any any long videos, but it's a good it forms a very good foundation if we you want to teach somebody how to edit videos. And these days, we a lot of the content that we are making available to students is in a digital format, and it has to be in preferably sometimes a video format. And in fact, the pandemic has pushed a lot of us to remote teaching or emergency remote teaching, where a lot of our classes has been recorded. In fact, not too dissimilar to the session that we have here today, where it's also recorded and it can immediately be made available. The challenge has always been that, you know, lecturers don't necessarily have the skill to know how to edit, you know, there's maybe some awkward moments in the class. How do I actually edit that? But my particular interest in focus has always been around digital storytelling. And because I said, I've seen it being used more often as a means of, you know, um, developing those skills, um, but more as a vehicle towards, you know, sort of more evidence-based assignments that's being offered by uh, lecturers uh, to the students. And so we are often called in um, to deliver and offer training to staff and students. You can move on to the next slide. So what the next slide basically you know, shows you is what the traditional storytelling uh, process looks like. And you can see these, there's about eight steps in there. Um, the first two steps is normally uh, you know, where the staff comes in um, or the subject experts are. Uh, comes becomes involved and those are obviously your lecturers it's very often sometimes maybe it's postgrad students or undergrad students we will come in as when i say we i'm talking about the center for innovative education communication technologies we would come in and offer training to students from step um, three onwards to about step six right so we focus a lot on, on the technical aspects the students go away they do the assignment they submit it and they get an assessment uh, it's only been now during the digital media literacy course that I've been more involved with the assessments as well. Um, there was something that I do did note ar around, you know, the digital storytellings. And um, I often wondered is that, you know, how effective are our interventions? Because we do offer a lot of training. Um, I think sometimes my work sounds similar to what uh, Sadler has, has kind of uh, pointed out at the beginning of the sessions where we have to learn a lot of tools and we then do training with staff and students on those particular tools. And what I do find is that even with staff, you I often find that staff would ask for students to be trained in the use of the software, but they themselves have never used the particular software. Um, and again, with my focus around digital stories, I often wonder as to why it is that once we've made an intervention, these assignments is just uh, or stories that's been developed is only being prevalent, um, you know, as a result or a consequence of the assignments. So for those of you who are interested, I've just posted a, a QR code in the chat. If you know how to use a QR code, um, you can, can look at some additional examples of stories. Obviously, you're not going to have time to do that here, but uh, it's a padlet that I've created with some examples 
of digital stories that you can can view. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so I've just shown the again, you know, some of the 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 different aspects that we are involved with. You can move on to the next one. Uh, sorry, Norma, could you just pass it on to the rest of the staff, <laughs> the rest of the participants? So as I, as I said, that story circle, that, that process that I sh showed over there, uh, there's a lot of, of um, uh, changes that's been made because our context is constantly changing because we work with different departments. We sometimes find that we have to work, uh, especially during the pandemic, we've had to do this uh, digital media literacy course uh, using the flipped classroom approach, which is part of blended uh, teaching and learning approach. And sometimes we sit with postgraduates that maybe range from 10 to 12 students, sometimes 18 students, which is a little bit more manageable. And other times, as you can see on the right hand side, we sit with large classes from ranging from 80 to 200 students in a blended learning environment. Um, and so it's not always possible to do to go through the full cycle doing this uh, digital storytelling circle with the students. Um, and the biggest, the biggest issue that I also find is that students will often just use the tools that's been presented to them. Um, very few of them actually, um, you know, go and delve deep, deeper and find out what other tools are available. So this left me with a question. We can move on to the next slide. As to how does the, the, the tools, you know, what are the forces that, that actually influence how we choose the tools um, we use? Um, what the approach that we, we now use is that we no longer actually just present them with one particular tool to use, but we um, offer them a range of different tools uh, so that they can actually, you know, choose for themselves. Because the one thing that is very difficult to assess, in fact, is where students are really are, are at in terms of their own digital literacies, where they are in terms of multimedia use. And so the idea is, is to give them more autonomy over their own learning, as well as agency, so they can uh, decide for themselves and, and weigh up for themselves where they are at. And what we also found is that when they choose as to what tools they want to use, um, they less inclined to actually always come after us for a solution to a problem that they encounter. You can go into the next slide. This, and this is the last slide. You can just move, just flick through this. This is a number of the different factors that they'll be looking at in terms of my own research as to what are some of the, the influences that these particular uh, factors has. So these are some of the tools that we present to them. Um, and we, we say, well, you know, bring your own device, bring a microphone, bring a dictaphone, bring a laptop, tablet, whatever it is that you have. And we work with what it is that you have and we teach them in this, um, give them training on this particular tools and then show them how to put things together. And as I said, the big question for me is really just how do our tools shape us at the end of the day and shape the stories that we tell. And I think that's well in. I'll see you only have one minute left. So thank you very much for your attention. If there's anybody that you might know is interested in digital storytelling and also just partnering, maybe give me some tips on how to go about doing this research, I'm open for your suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, are there any questions for Andre from the floor, from the other virtual participants? Okay, then I think I'm going to hand over to Jean. Great, colleagues, thank you so much for making the Edge Ignite possible. I think we can give ourselves and the organizers and everybody a good hand. I ran out of hands here. <laughs> Just a few last um, uh, items before we go, especially given that non-productive or, you know, <laughs> session that we had, so we could just uh, make sure we don't run into problems. Given that you can still register if you need to show that you were here um, at Jessica, if you possibly didn't register this morning, uh, then please, as a minimum, at the back of your lanyard, there's a small card uh, with small text on it that says, uh, before you give uh, your lanyard back, please uh, describe uh, your experience at the Edge Ignite in one word, just one word at the back of this card. And you can just leave it on your table, we will collect it. Um, there's also a QR code on your table. If you are willing to give us some feedback, that'll be great. We'll also be in touch afterwards to get some feedback uh, because we do this around the country in every way that we can make this better and more uh, effective uh, for the community um, helps us a lot. 
And um, then again, if you're attending the ELAN workshop tomorrow, please be reminded to install ELAN beforehand. And if you've got questions about that, you're welcome to come and ask me about that. And uh, then the last bit that I have is that if you are not coming to a workshop, you can kindly just hand back your linear, then we can reuse it at a future DH Ignite. But I really thank all of you for making this possible. This event would not have been possible without you and all of your input. And as you've seen, and I hope you've uh, experienced over the last few days, is that DH Ignite has, uh, you know, brought to the fore that digital humanities and coming into the computational things in humanities and social sciences is a multifaceted thing. You are not in it alone. There's a lot of people working in this environment. There's a lot of support out there. And there's hopefully after this event a lot of places where you can come to knock for assistance, for opportunities, for resources. So I wish you well. Thank you again so much for this. I uh, hope you are ignited. So go set the world on fire in a very positive sense. Okay. Not literal. Please. <laughs> yeah, so all the best. Safe travels and really thank you so much for, for, for being here. All the best. <laughs>